If you are looking for something from God tonight, press in. Press in. Reminding God, I need you. I need you, Lord. I need something specifically from you. I need a word from you. I need my health restored. I need my finances restored. I need my credit restored. But most of all, I need my life restored. Without our life being restored, it don't matter all the money you have, all the things you have, all the cars and money, houses, it really don't matter. It don't mean a thing unless you got Jesus Christ living in you. Amen. Without Jesus Christ, you're just walking through. Man, I feel the presence of God here tonight. Amen. I'm going to let Crystal talk. You know, I, I'm on social media a lot because that's how a lot of people reach out about Chrissy's house and things, and we're always looking for new speakers and just people to inspire and uplift people. And something one day, scrolling through, I happened to see a story or something about Kyle, and I was like, oh, okay, you know, so I, I clicked on it and read it and added him as a friend, and I've been following him for about the past six months, and I just heard God just speak to me and say, you've got to get him to come and speak, so... I'm gonna let him tell his story, but here he is, Mr. Kyle Brewer. Well, I would say that at this point, I would be fine with just going home after the meal and the worship, because that was just amazing. So uh, I would just like to give a, uh, another uh, round of applause to the, the worship leader, that was amazing. I want to say thank you to Crystal for inviting me and thank you for David uh, for having me out and thank you to each one of you for being here this evening and allowing me to just share what God's done in my life. Um, it's an honor and a privilege and I don't take it lightly, uh, so thank you. Um, like Crystal said, my name is Kyle, Kyle Brewer. Uh, I'm 30 years old and before I get too far into it, uh, I would like to just say a word of prayer because uh, my words are, are nothing. I want God to speak through me and to, to inspire others with the hope that he's given me. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in fellowship with, a, with a, um, a other believers, to gather together, to lift up your name, Lord, because you are the reason that we have life today. God, everything that you've done in my life, everything that you brought me through and everything you continue to do each and every day is for your glory and your honor. So I pray that you communicate that message through me this evening, Lord, and I pray that you will open hearts and ears to hear and receive a word, not from me, but from you. Lord, we love you, we trust you, and we lift your name up high. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So once again, thank you. My name is Kyle Brewer. Uh, I'm 30 years old. And I'm going to tell my story. I have like four scriptures that I'm going to mention throughout the story. I'll share them now just so if you want to dive into them later. And it's Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27. Ephesians 6, 12. Romans 8, 28. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And so I grew up not too far from here in Benton, Arkansas. Uh, born in Memphis, but it was because my family lived in West Memphis. Memphis was just a close hospital. Uh, and then I shortly ended up in Benton, where I grew up, started elementary school. Um, my grandmother, church and faith, that was not a part of my upbringing, um, not something that was in the house at all. Drugs and alcohol and incarceration certainly was. That was very much normalized in my childhood. Going to Barner and Cummins and visiting uncles that are, you know, incarcerated for distribution and manufacturing of methamphetamines was just a normal thing. That, that was no surprise to me. I um, mean, so I was really introduced to that at a, at a young age and I watched it growing up. Um, but I didn't really dive into it until about 12 years old. And this is why I look back and I know why. Uh, my grandmother, I was really close to her. She had her own issues with substance use as well, but. Near the end of her life, she was, uh, I, could, I, could, I know now that God was working on her. Uh, God was softening her heart and drawing him to him. And, and it was that, during that point in my life, she had encouraged me to go to church. Uh, like I said, I was like 11 or 12 at this time. So I went to Spring Creek Baptist Church uh, there off the interstate in Benton. And I remember I said a prayer. 
I even got baptized. I went to church camp for the first time. Uh, and it was great. I loved it. I loved the youth pastor there. Uh, he was a great influence in my life. And then two things happened. My grandmother passed away. And that youth pastor that was a big influence on my life, he got another job at another church in town and took it. It was, it was a, a promotion. And so that happened. Those two things combined was enough for me to walk away from it. Um, and so that was when I started using alcohol for the first time. And I want to read the second half of Matthew uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 24 through 27. And it says, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So this point in my life is when I started to build my house on sand. Um, I started experimenting with alcohol. That quickly led to using cough syrup and, it, uh, you know, using that to change the way that I feel. And it wasn't uh, just the six months after that, I smoked marijuana for the first time. And it was off to the races from there. I was, I was then and have been since the type of person that I would say, I don't do this. I won't do this. But the first time I did it, it was full blast. I did it from that point forward. It was just a part of my arsenal of things that I do. And so every substance I picked up along the way was like that. Marijuana was the one that I started using every day, the one that really started taking uh, control of my life. And I got arrested for the first time at the age of 16. Uh, the block site blue holes. I was smoking with some older guys and I got a possession charge. And so then I was in the legal system on probation. Um, and anybody that's ever been on probation, you know that you can't really smoke weed and get away with it on probation. Well, I tried to the best of my ability to do that. And I was pretty successful the first six months. Well, my family, my parents had known what was going on and they were frustrated with my probation officer for not uh, catching me. And so they picked me up unannounced the day before I was supposed to get off that six months probation, took me directly to my probation officer and made him give me a urine screen. And, you know, of course I failed that. And so back in front of the judge, uh, six more months probation, 48 hours in jail, um, you know, a couple things suspended. Well, so I realized then, like, okay, I can't keep smoking weed. So then I would switch back to my alcohol and my alcohol consumption really revved up. I started drinking vodka every day by myself, you know, and basically just switch one substance for another. I also got a job at Walmart, uh, and I'm trying to provide, you know, just basic things as a, you know, a teenager in high school, uh, cigarettes, alcohol, and gas. That was like all I wanted or all I needed. And so working at Walmart, it happens to be that they sell all three of those things. And so me and another guy, we came up with this idea to start swiping gift cards without putting money in the cash register. And so you know, Walmart counts their money. And so it wasn't long where they found out about that. And, you know, thankfully they stopped me before it was a felony charge, but that was my third strike. And so I'm back in front of the judge, probation revocation again. And he was going to send me to what's called C-STEP, basically a boot camp for teenagers. The one thing that I had going for me and that I was able to continue to have going, going for me as I go forward was my education. I was able to balance uh, you know, the substance use and my education and still do well in school. And so my family like petitioned the court to say, hey, if we make him go here, he's gonna fail a senior year of high school. Is there any way we can pursue some type of rehab because it's all related to substance use? So the judge agreed to that, and so I went to rehab for the first time. I went to a place in Fort Smith called Horizons, and I stayed there for about 75 days, returned back to Benton, finished my senior year of high school, got off probation, and, and during that season, I started hanging out with some, some friends that weren't necessarily doing drugs. They still drank, but they were kind of thinking for the future, and so that got me thinking about college. A fun fact about me that I learned during this time that you might not guess is that I am a, a quarter Native American. Blonde hair, blue eyed Native American. And the reason that's important is because I was able to obtain scholarships for, for college. And so I started applying for school and I went to UCA uh, on a full ride scholarship uh, from the Oneida Nation tribe. They pay for my education. And, and so I'm off to college now. And I, I'm off probation, so I'm back to using drugs. 
something really important happened my freshman year of college. I am I'm there. I already you know I'm already really into partying and that lifestyle. That's kind of like my thing. I've really taken that on as my identity. Like I mentioned, this is what I'm building my life on. My identity was in. Uh, how much partying I can do, you know, how many girls I could be with, you know, all, the money, the status, the popularity, those types of things is what, like, I thought what my self-worth was defined in. Um, and so my freshman year, I got my wisdom teeth removed. And it was then when I got a prescription of oxycodone. And I'd had prescription pain pills here and there growing up, but nothing like this. They were they allowed me to call for three months and just get a refill by calling over the phone and saying that my, my teeth were hurting. And so that was my first like real long-term exposure to opioids. And it was from that point forward where like I liked other drugs and alcohol, but I really liked these. And like I said earlier, once I started doing something, I, it was a part of what I did. And so from that point forward, anytime I found, found some pills, I'd buy them. And, uh, you know, it, it just progressed. It went from using a couple here, a couple there, to I found more powerful opioids and started snorting them and starting using them in different manners. And, you know, it wasn't before too long that I was on heroin. But while that's all taking place, another story's taking place, uh, I guess you'd, you'd say from the social media perspective. So we have our lives on Facebook and what we show to the world, but then in our private life, you know, there can be something else going on. Well, that's, that's how I was, and I was very good at doing that. So I was, you know, abusing pills along with other alcohol and drugs in my private life, but I was really excelling academically, socially, um, in all those areas of life. So I, I was like putting my identity in these things and they were allowing me to keep this lie above water because I'm getting this money for school and that's fueling my addiction and allowing me to live this lifestyle and not really suffer the consequences from it. I did get arrested a couple times throughout college for alcohol related things, but for the most part, my parents are getting letters from the school saying I'm making 4.0s and so they're happy. I'm in Conway, so nobody really sees what I'm doing. And you know, I'm holding down leadership positions on campus. And at this point in my story, it's like, you would look at me as a 22 year old guy and say, he's doing everything he's supposed to be doing and he's doing it well. Um, but the sad reality is, is that I was fully blown addicted to pills and that's what was running my life. Because, you know, I woke up on May 5th of 2013, that was the day I graduated college. And that should be a day that I remember as like a celebratory day where I'm with my family and we're just like, you know, celebrating the, the academic achievements and all those types of things and the hard work. But that's not what I remember about that day. What I remember is waking up and I was sick. I was sick from not having any pills and I was worried and I was in that obsession mode of scheming and trying to figure out how I was gonna get this, how I was gonna get that. And so I'm on my phone and I find, you know, I was able to get seven Hydro 7.5s and that gave me enough strength to walk across the stage and pick up my, my degree. So the real ironic part about me getting a degree is that it was actually a bachelor's of science in addiction studies. So I was getting a degree uh, studying the disease of addiction and how the things that I'm doing in my private life will, you know, will result in this happening to an individual. But for me being the person that that's not gonna happen to and how I'm gonna somehow one day just stop doing what I'm doing and walk away from it, suffer no consequences, um, that's that's the belief I bought into and you know I thought I was for my family and my friends and by doing all these things on the exterior and making them think I was doing right but the sad truth is I was only fooling myself and so I graduated and the things that I placed my identity in the fraternity the academics the money I was getting from the scholarships the girls the lifestyle all those things slowly went away because I wasn't in school anymore and so I tried to, to, to figure out a plan of how to keep this type of lifestyle going. And uh, I graduated with no student loan debt. 12 months after I graduated, I had $9,000 in student loan debt because, and I didn't complete any of those courses. I, I took out loans because it was the only plan I could come up with to continue the type of lifestyle that I had created. And I learned then I couldn't just walk away because like I mentioned earlier, when I didn't have it, I was sick. I mean, it, it was, there was no like, it wasn't about feeling good or getting high anymore. It was about just being well and like being at a place where I could function and do normal tasks. And so I just was caught up in that cycle where I'd use 
And then I had like eight hours, six to eight hours to get something again before I got sick. And so that was my life. And so that obviously didn't work. And uh, I, I, I moved back to Benton from Conway. Um, I'm trying to manage this life that I'm, that I'm now have, and it's all starting to come to the surface. My family knows what's going on again. Um, my friends, they know what's going on. Now I've started lying and cheating and stealing. All the things that typically come along with the lifestyle I was just describing, now I'm doing them because I don't have all these other things that help me keep the lie uh, a secret. Um, and so it was, you know, I started, I got a DWI. I got a DWI that I went to jail with for four times because I couldn't pay my fines because I'd get out, get a payment plan, start using, couldn't pay the payment plan, and I would get a warrant put out. And so that happened until they told me I just had to sit in jail for 30 days. And it was in that jail that my mom was messaging me on the kiosk and she was saying, hey, like, look, you have a problem. You need to go to rehab. You need to get help. And I was like, you know, I don't have a problem. I'm not sick. I was saying all this stuff back to her. And it's crazy now when I look back, like I left that jail, nobody to pick me up because I burned on my bridges. I walked across the street to the first gas station, called my friend, had him come pick me up. He, he had just got a new truck and was like really happy and he was like, let's go to Colorado. And so we took off and it wasn't like 30 minutes after I got out of jail that I was high and I was drinking and I was going across the, the country to just party. I had no purpose and I was just living this lifestyle. And I look back now and it's so clear to me there was a problem there, right? But in the middle of it, I was in full-blown denial and did not see what was going on. Again, like I said, building my life on sand. And so now I, I, I don't have anywhere to go. I'm, I'm, I'm essentially homeless. And so it's these circumstances that forced me into seeking treatment for the first time. Um, I'd gotten out of jail. I, you know, at this point, my drug use had progressed to using a needle and the whole nine yards, and it was just bad. Very dark place. If you've been there, you understand that like, that's just one of those places that I always say I'd never go, but then I find myself there, doing things I never thought I would do, hanging out with people I thought I'd never be with, um, and I was that person, you know? And um, so a series of circumstances forced me to go into a place called RCA, a 30-day program in 2016. Um, in that program, I kind of broke out of denial. I saw that, okay, I got a problem with drugs. I probably need to stop using drugs, but I got out. And uh, the drinking part, that never registered to me that it was an issue. Like, I thought, like, drugs was my thing. I could drink still. I was 26 at the time. I thought, you know, a 26-year-old guy, I drink, that's just part of normal life, right? Well, so I had to learn a lesson in that process. So for about the next eight months, I'd drink on the weekends until eventually I learned this, that when I drink alcohol, I become a different person. I talk differently. I hang out with different people. I even listen to different music. And my judgment is impaired, and I'm more likely to get introduced to drug use. And so those two things happened one night, and so I started using again. And it was in a period of uh, five months from the time I started using. I overdosed driving down the dry, uh, interstate um, right before the, the baseline exit, and I hit a side rail, and I woke up. That woke me up. And I drove to the next exit, called a state trooper, told him that a truck drove me off, and you know I reported an accident that way. Well, I drove that car back to Benton, and I slept in that car for the next four months, um, just just trying to you know I'm you're going to work for us to get like a check every day, just living that lifestyle, trying to maintain and just trying to stay well. Well, in that five months, everything got worse, and everything got you know to the place it never been before. And I, I, the, the reason I ended up at my bottom was this. It was not because I saw like a, a reason to get help. I, I was actually trying to detox myself off of heroin by using meth. And I was doing that for about 10 days in a hotel room in Benton. And I put myself in a drug-induced psychosis. And one of the uncles that I mentioned earlier, he had been in and out of penitentiary all my life. About six years ago now, he got out and went to a church in North Little Rock, First Assembly, and started attending Celebrate Recovery, and he's still in recovery today. Well, so the rest of my family was like, you know, just crying and stuff, and there's nothing they could do for me in that moment, because I'm calling, tripping out, saying there's people out to get me. What my uncle saw was an opportunity. Not that I was calling, saying, help me, but he saw I was in a state of mind where I was willing to just get picked up, and he could take me somewhere, and me not really even know what was going on. I know now that there were many prayers going on behind the scenes for many years up to this point with him and the people at this church and my family. Well, so when he came and picked me up, he had already called the church, Pastor Lane. Pastor Lane had a relationship with the Nehemiah house, and they had already, like, kind of set this up where I was able to get dropped off there. It was a homeless shelter at the time, uh, and I got dropped off on a Sunday night at 12 o'clock. 
My uncle said, go in there, don't tell anybody the things that you're telling me, and just go to sleep. <laughs> uh, well, if you've ever been in a drug-induced psychosis, that's not how it worked out. I, uh, I did go in there, and they sent me in a homeless shelter with about 40 other guys, pitch black dark, and I was tripped out all night long until the staff came in, Jeremy and BJ. They came in the next morning, and I'm like, I think there's the cops after me for a double homicide. All this is going on. And they look at me and they're like, we're going to call an ambulance for you. <laughs> and so they called an ambulance. Ambulance picked me up and took me to Baptist. I got tackled and restrained in the emergency department at Baptist. Had to get shot with Halidol. Uh, but they got me to the detox up, upstairs. And at that point, I thought, um, not like, hey, I want to get help. But I thought, like, I don't know what else to do. I don't have anywhere else to go. They had told me when I left the Nehemiah's, if I go to the hospital, get detox, I can come back and talk about joining their recovery program. And so when I got discharged, that was my only option. It was either be on the street and have nowhere to go, have nothing, or go to this program. And so I did, not with a desire to change my life, but just uh, with the desire not to be homeless. I say that to say, like, whatever brings us here, I truly believe because it happened to me that God can use it. If we just give God a little bit, he can do a lot. And so he, uh, and that's what he's done in my life. And so I, I entered that program, uh, faith-based program, Nehemiah House, nine-month program. I'm looking at nine months, like, are you kidding me? I'm not doing this. So for two months, I fought the process. I did not want to be there. I tried to call every, you know, everybody I could think of that might come get me. Nobody would come get me. Uh, so after about two months, I like this. I started thinking, I started like listening and I started looking at the guys that are in the program and the guys that have been there and, and like how they were just living, like they were happy. They were, you know, having fun. They were not using drugs and alcohol. And I was like, you know, I started getting hope for myself that this could potentially happen for me because from the time I was 12 to the time I was 27, my life it was centered around either a drug or alcohol, one of the two. And so it was a foreign concept to me. Well, I made two decisions. I can't tell you the moment. I can't tell you the specific circumstance. I think it was more a process within that first two months. And I refer to it as like my process of surrendering. And I made two decisions. My first decision was I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And what that meant was just not lip service. That What that meant was what it says at the beginning of Matthew chapter 7. It says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And so what that scripture tells me is that application of God's word in my, in my life is where the foundation is built. And so I started taking the information that they were giving me, the information I was learning in the scriptures, and I was trying to apply it to my life. And I was, you know, doing it to the best of my ability, imperfectly for sure. Some days I still didn't want to be there, but I remembered I gave my life to God. That's the first decision. Second decision was I was going to surrender to the idea that God was going to use this program to change my life. And that meant all in, like nine months, I'm going to complete the program. I'm going to follow the rules that I like, the ones I didn't like. I'm going to hang out with the guys that I like that I didn't like. On the days where I don't want to be there, if anybody's in a program, there are days when you don't want to be there. Because there was days, even when I was on fire for the Lord, where I just didn't want to be there anymore. But I fell back on that decision that God's going to use this program to change my life. And so nothing happened overnight, but I started slowly changing. And I started, scripture started like really uh, hitting me in a certain way when I started like really learning and hearing God's voice speaking to me through his word and through the teachings and through church. And we're attending a local church throughout this program. And I'm trying to get involved and, and you know, connect with people in this community because I was realizing that like recovery was not about a program or a certain amount of time. It's about a lifestyle. And so just like recovery, that is also my Christian life. Christian life is a lifestyle change that they talk about people, places, and things, and got to get rid of those, and that's true. But you take all the all that away from me, then what do I do? You know, like where I found those new things was in the local church, and they that's where I found and discovered a new life. And so, 
I go through this program, I'm learning scripture, I'm growing in my faith. I got baptized at that church at, at First Assembly in North Little Rock. Um, I, was, I tried to be involved in everything that I can. I'm attending Celebrate Recovery. I'm working the steps. I'm going through all these classes, and, you know, I'm loving it. Some days I don't, but, you know, I stay. I stick and stay. I don't, I don't act on my emotion at the time. I just stick and stay. Um, I remember one thing in specifically that, that I learned one night that, that really helped me because I had a friend in the program with me. We were the same age, very similar alike, and some days we would get on each other's nerves, and we would get, get, get under each other's skin. And one night in the class, his name's Clayton Parr. If anybody's ever been to Nehemiah, you know Clayton Parr. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And it, it just was clear as day that my issue was not with my friend Cody. My issue is not with anybody here. That, like the enemy has uh, an agenda for my life, just like God has a purpose for my life. But the enemies is to steal, kill, and destroy. And oftentimes, if he can get me fixed on an individual that I'm having conflict with, it doesn't matter how he does it, because in that moment, I've got my eyes away from God, and I'm not fixed on Christ, and I got hate in my heart, and he's, he's accomplishing his goal. So that helps me with my relationships with other people, that like when I'm having an issue with them, it helps me to, to zoom out of it and to see that, hold up, like there's something else going on here, that my issue is not really with you. It's the enemy. He's trying to get to me, and he knows how to use you to get to me. And so that really helped me in, in that moment, and it has continued to help me today to, uh, to just interact with others, to be graceful towards others, and uh, to just have healthy relationships because it's not about the person, it's about the enemy. That's the real battle that's going on. Um, so I went through the program. Uh, I graduated the program after nine months. Um, I can't tell you enough about the people there and the local church, first and similar, that I attended in that program. They showed me the character of God in a tangible way. And man, it just really ministered to me and, you know, changed my life. My life was changed there. God used the program, like I said, to change my life. And I never thought after nine months that I would stay, right? I would leave the first time I got a chance. Well, I came up on graduation. I did not have a safe plan. I didn't have a place to go. My parents, after four months, were like, you can come home. You can have the bedroom, you know. I, they were so happy, but I knew some real changes were going on. And I said, no, I know that's not where God wants me to be, you know, like, I'm a 27-year-old man at this point. Like, I just, I love y'all. I'm appreciative of your opportunity, but I just don't think that's where I'm supposed to go. And so when nine months came, that was still the only option I had. And and I didn't take it because I realized that, yeah, maybe I had to stay at this, uh, this shelter, basically, in this program for some additional time, but I just didn't have the peace of God. The cloud haven't, hasn't moved from the Nehemiah house at that point. Just kind of like when the Israelites would fall in the cloud, like it hadn't moved. So I, I stayed. And so I say that to encourage anybody, if you're trying to contemplate a decision whether to go or whether to stay, if it, the cloud hasn't moved and there's not a safe plan, there's not the peace of God in it, just stay still. Because I had all my needs met there and I had no reason to go. Um, and so I did stay. They asked me to work with them as an intern. I stayed there for about three months. And then the cloud moved. First Assembly offered me the opportunity to come over there and, and uh, do some seminary work through their school program and move into some apartments there. Uh, at this point, because I've been out of the program, I just got fully involved in that church. And the people and the team there had just like opened their arms to me and let me just, uh, you know, be a part of the family. And like I said, that's where I found a new community. I started playing softball. I just had fun, you know? I mean, I still like to do things. Just because I'm not using and drinking no more doesn't mean I don't like to enjoy life. But I can do all of those things without using a substance, and I can do them with people that also aren't using substances, and they're real, and they're authentic, and they're genuine, and there's meaningful memories made. And so I was, I was experiencing that, I was enjoying that, and now I'm living at a church, basically. I'm at a church that I live there. And so I'm there seven days a week. I'm getting to learn about the like how a church works as an organization. Incredible learning opportunities from the team over there. And something happened, it's, I have to tell it, uh, it's an incredible story. So I didn't have a vehicle, I didn't have a job. I moved because they, they were letting me go to school and a place to live. Well, you know, that's kind of one thing that I'm sure if you don't have that right now that you can relate to, that's something that we want. Like, that's a desire. I want to work. I want to have a vehicle. Independence, basically. 
And I didn't have those things. There were multiple times where I might have jumped at the opportunity to make it happen. But I, like I said, I sat still. And so God did something incredible. He used this local church to really show me himself by blessing me in a mighty way. They have a service there called Family Christmas, and it's where they bless families in the services. And I have a Jeep right over there. And so they called me up on stage, and they told my story and how I was going to school there. And they pulled this Jeep into the sanctuary and give it to me, like hand me the keys over to me. I never owned a car in my life. I never went to the to the DMV to do registration papers. I've never done anything like that. And so, like, it was just moving because not only did they do that, they hired me to work there on staff at the church, a part of the fatherhood program that they had going on. And so it was just like, a, that sh I share that just to say that, like, that was God. That was God showing me to just wait and I'll provide. Like, I'll just wait and I'll provide. And so that, that was, you know, life was good. Life was going well. And I was very heavily involved in recovery. I remember how much time, energy, resources, and money I put into drinking and getting high. And I took on the mentality that, what if I just put that much time, energy, and resources, and money into recovery and into my faith in Jesus? And like, let's see what happens. And so that's what I did. That's what I continued to do. And so, like I said, I'm in recovery, and I started hearing about something called peer recovery. Uh, basically, the concept is that someone that's been through a process is, is turning around helping others go through the same process. Very similar to discipleship is kind of how we would refer to it in, in church. And so I went through some training uh, through the state with no desire to do it as a job. And I went through the training. And I want to tell you this. Up to this point, my recovery journey had been like, like sky high. Good experiences have been great. But I wanna, I'm not going to sit up here and act like I'm a perfect person. I, had, uh, I made some poor decisions at this point in time. And I failed for the first time in recovery. I didn't return to drug and alcohol use, but I also learned about the process of sanctification that I have so much more going on with me than drug and alcohol use. And so I'd made a bad decision, and that set a series of circumstances in motion. But what I learned in that is Romans 8.28, where it says that we know uh, that for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, God works all things together for good. And so how I learned that was, you know, the scripture in that moment, like, because I, 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 I tasted and seen the goodness of God up to this point. And I know, like, turning away from that was not the answer. But it was about the applying that in the middle of a, of a, of a mess. That was when some transformation happened. I saw, I saw, so I, I leaned into the things that I learned. Love God, love people. That's what he's called me to do. And so I just kept doing that. I didn't leave the church. I didn't leave the body. I didn't separate myself. I kept doing the things I'd been doing. And that is what I truly believe unlocks that scripture there. Like if we pursue God in a relationship with him and love people, that's when he can use all things together for good. Because it's not for my good. It's for his glory. That's the good. And so when we're loving God and loving people in the middle of whatever the circumstances is, he can use it for good. And this is what he did. Because of, because of a, I went through the training, I made a poor decision. Three months later, UAMS uh, hired me as a peer support specialist in the emergency department. And what that means and what that looks like, and that's what I do today still, is uh, I'm stationed in the emergency department. An individual comes in for anything related to drugs or alcohol, and I get to spend time with them. I get to uh, just be there, let them know they're not alone. And then if they're interested in maybe getting connected to treatment resources or recovery or just taking my phone number, I, I help in that process and provide support. And so it's like the ultimate way of taking everything in my past and it gives it purpose today. And I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Because I could have like turned away from it all. Like praising God in the middle of a good season is good and we should do it. We should praise him. But praising God when things aren't looking so good, praising God when things are tough or when you're facing some loss or some pain, that's when I've experienced God move in the biggest ways because it required faith. It required me to lean on scripture and to apply it into my life. And it was because of that that God started, you know, he started making a way where it seemed to be no way. And so I, I've just, I've continued to do that. I, I've been given opportunities to, to, to practice that on a daily basis, working at the hospital and helping other people get connected to treatment and recovery. Um, 
I have a, I have a pretty good life. When I say good, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not homeless today, you know, like, and that's pretty good in my eyes. Uh, I'm not caught up on the, the materialistic things that I once was. I know my, my identity and my self-worth are not based on anything other than what Jesus Christ on the cross for me. And uh, that's the message that, that he gave me. That's, the, that's what he's done in my life, and that's the hope that I have today when it's good and when it's bad because I have bad days today too. I have days where life is just hitting me in the face. But remember what it said in Matthew, that when you hear the words and apply them, the rains and the storms can come, but the, the, the foundation that's built on a rock will stand still. And so that's where I, I lean into that. I lean into the people that are, that are around me, that encourage me, that hold me accountable. Uh, I, I, I just surround myself with people that are going to keep me focused on the Lord. And I'm so thankful for that because me standing here talking to y'all, there's literally hundreds of people standing behind me. I'm not here without hundreds of people that have prayed, that have invested, that have ministered to me and have and continue to do that. And so I, I can't say enough how much that means to me. The last thing I want to close with um, is because that's, that's God's story right there. But like I said, I have some bad days and, and, and you might relate to this, that there are days when... Uh, the enemy, or even my own self, I want to I want to bring up the past, or I want to focus on a failure. I want to talk about like who I used to be or what I used to do, or I'll fall back into old behaviors or things like of that nature. But I want you to know when the enemy reminds you of those things, and when you find yourself in that place, Second Corinthians five seventeen, it says that therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What that tells me that it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what I'm facing. That's the truth that I, that I choose to stand on today, that I'm a new creation. And my past, my failures, my mistakes from my past do not define me today. And it's the love of God that I stand on that enables me and propels me to turn away from bad decisions today and keep moving forward and, and you know, do my best to turn around and help other people that are going through the same things. And so, uh, you know, I just want to say that I'm so thankful to have been out here to, to speak and to share, like, what God's done in my life. Uh, but I want you to know this, that there is absolutely nothing special or unique about me. I was homeless a little over three years ago. I had nothing. It's Jesus that's special here. And it's Jesus that, just like addiction doesn't discriminate, neither does the Lord. Like, he can take a mess and he can turn it into a beautiful story. Um, and I know he's working that out in all of our lives today. And so uh, I just want to say thank you for, for letting me share. Crystal and David, thank you for inviting me to be out here. Thank you. an awesome, awesome testimony. Can we relate? Yeah. I can relate. Amen. Man, that's, that's, you know, that's what God wants for us. He wants the best for us. But, you know, ultimately it, it was his decision and he made the right decision. Does anybody need a special prayer tonight? Anybody need prayer at all? If you do, hey, we're here. Don't everybody move at once. I'm going to be honest with you, Kyle. I've been going through some stuff. You know, the devil's been putting stuff in my past just a few years ago. Putting stuff in my past and bringing it up, throwing it up at me. Look at that. Look at that. But you know, Kyle's right. You've got to stand your ground. You've got to say, you know what? My God is going to get me through it. And you know what? I'm going to keep looking to him. I take authority over Satan when he starts bringing up that old mess from the past. And I say, I ain't going to take it. I will not accept it. I am a new person in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Kyle, for coming and sharing. My wife's waving. I don't know why. I don't know what she wants. Prayer for Landon. Well, come up here. Stand in for him. Her son, Landon. He's supposed to be going to the other side, guys, Ooh, Monday. Man. Look at that. Yeah. When you got, come on, some of you guys on the other side, come on up here. Let's pray. 
Anybody that feels like praying, come on up here. Uh, uh, hey, come on. Who's praying? All right. All right. You ready? All right. Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you that we come before you believing by faith in the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names. We lift up Landon to you right now, Father God, as, as Satan would try to discourage him or, or uh, call him from a, a different way that he not go Monday. Father God, we bind that right now in Jesus' name and say, Landon, you got to go. Follow that cloud in the name of Jesus Christ right now. Landon, you have to go to the other side. You have to seek out Jesus Christ for the answer to all your problems. We believe that Jesus is the cure for all things. Not just anything, but all things. We thank you, Father, that we're going to believe by faith. Come Monday morning, he will be at the other side getting his life restored. And people will be pouring into his life. Each and every one of these men would welcome him in and let him know that he is welcome and become a friend of him, Lord Jesus. We thank you for it. We praise you for it, that his life will be restored in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, my God. We thank you for it. We believe it right now. And everybody said, amen. 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 God bless everyone. Thank you, other side, for coming. Anybody else need anything? Man, I wish I had guns like that. <laughs> yeah, if you don't mind, please bring the chairs back in the building, help us out.